Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. All across this summer, we've been walking through the Psalms. Last week, Jeff and Sam took us through Psalm 46. We talked about what it meant to rest in the Lord. I think the Psalm for today is a wonderful companion to that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 84. Psalm 84. And I'm going to walk us through this. If you would, just follow along with me. Everybody have it? The psalmist writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord, and my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, and they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. God of Jacob, look, up, uh, look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, and I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Well, across this series, Jeff has invited members of our church family to come share their story. And this morning, we have Candy Hollingshead coming. Candy may not be known to many of you. She's a fairly new member here at Park Cities. But Travis and I sat down with her this past week and just asked her to share her story. And I want you to know, when she finished, we both just looked at each other and went, wow, Candy, don't change a word. And so um, I hope you haven't changed a word. She's been in the chapel service, and she's sharing what Psalm 84 says to her in experience of what God's done in her life. So Candy, share with us about this psalm. Well, thank you, and I pray that this is received in the spirit it's been written and being delivered in. Uh, to me, this psalm is a song of joy of how living with God is drastically different than living without God, mm -hmm. and I think my life is an example of this. I never saw my parents in a room together until 1997. Between steps, halves, a father in the military and a full-time working mother, I learned early that to be loved meant having friends and achieving things. That being that the more you did, the more you were liked, and the more you achieved, the more you were noticed. And this was basically my young teen and college life, always working for social acknowledgement awards, being in the popular crowd, always working, constantly worried that I might lose everything. Why wasn't I happy and why wasn't it enough? Out of college, at a time when many were not finding jobs at all, I had a job waiting for me. Ironically enough, I had attended church with my grandmother, um, which was not often. I met the president of a company who offered me a job not only waiting for me to graduate, but paying more than most had, had thought of. I got even a better job from there. And once again, always working, I had to make more money, get more promotions, uh, and be acknowledged as a superstar in the company. I was given the opportunity to truly see if money and popularity brought happiness. Mm. I had a six-figure salary and could afford nice clothes, cars, trips, pretty much whatever I wanted to do. And I worked hard and I played hard. Once again, why wasn't I happy? Why wasn't it enough? And it continued. I married my husband, and as much as we loved each other, it wasn't enough. Well, if we owned a house, I'd be happy, but no. If we had a baby, I'd be happy, but no. Now, most of you are thinking, really, how could you not be happy? 
Well, I was while I was accepting an award or driving a car off the lot or walking down an aisle, down the aisle, or bringing my son home. But it was sporadic and extremely temporary. And eventually in 2013, I couldn't think of anything to make me happy, and I crashed. I no longer had hope for happiness. There was nothing left to try. I checked out. I did the minimum necessary to be considered a functioning person. During all those years and all those blessings, I ended up not with great memories and wealth and happiness. I ended up with sadness, perfectionism, obsessiveness, and loneliness. In October of 2013, I was in about as dark a place as you could be. I heard a voice and it told me to buy a Bible. I did, and I started reading, just reading. Slowly, I began hearing a calling to go to church. I came to Park Cities with my son, who had never seen a church. Then I started noticing that after 20 years with my husband, I was really in the marriage. I was really being a mom, and I loved it. I was not working. I was not winning awards. In fact, I started doing volunteer work, and I launched several Bible programs. A new life was taking over. I now know real joy. It's not getting something or doing something. It's seeing God's power and presence throughout the day in me and in others. It's knowing God has blessed me and taken care of me. In 2011, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I went through it alone and without God. I was told that I had 1% chance of reoccurrence, and in 2014, I was diagnosed again. The doctors were shaken. The Lord was with me, and I went through it again, but this time not alone, hmm. and with hope, and the, that the Lord's will would win, and whatever the outcome, I would end in the best place. I now, I now find great happiness in the thrill of waiting for what God will do next, in knowing that I will see God one day. These days, though scattered with ups and downs, flaws and faults, sadness and joy, poor reactions of worry and fear, I find strength and peace, forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ, and he is enough. Peace is listening to God and trying not to speak as much. It's God's mercy on a sinner every day I walk this earth. The greatest title or achievement that I have had has been a child of God. This psalm is about the beauty and joy of life with God, how life becomes a gift, not a struggle, and pleasure and peace are obtainable. Happiness does not come at a cost or sporadically. Where love rules, and you wouldn't trade it for anything. And as the psalm says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. God bless you. Candy, thank you for sharing your, your journey. I think the best thing we could do to thank Candy is to pray with her right now. So would you bow with me? Father, as we hear this story of a journey, a journey ultimately to you, we thank you for what you've done in Candy's life, for how you've blessed her and how you've used her now to bless us. Father, we pray for the peace and the the joy that she has, that, Father, it would communicate to us what's possible in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray for each of us as we open your word now that we might see what Candy saw. We might see the glory of Jesus. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Candy. Well, you're going to see on the screen a photograph and it's a photograph that means a great deal to me. This is my mom's home place. It's in rural South Carolina. It's in a place called Silver Street, about seven miles outside of it. If you go to Google, Google Maps and put in Silver Street, it's going to say, huh? I mean, it is very rural. My mom and her nine siblings were raised in this home, and my grandfather and his siblings were raised there. It's been in the family for almost 140-plus years. It's a great place for me. And if you ask me about my childhood, I'm always going to take you back to this place. You know, when you've got nine aunts and uncles, there's always cousins. I had cousins much older. I had cousins younger. And you would come, and there was just people everywhere. Some of the best memories of my childhood were right here. 
It would be around a lunch table. That was the big meal in that home. And we'd all gather, and an uncle or a great uncle, they would say the blessing. It would be drifting off to sleep at night and hearing aunts and uncles and my mom and my dad as they laughed about life and times past, and I would hear them talk about the concerns of the day. For me, it was a place of belonging, a place of family, of significance. Much of what Candy was saying, it was a place where you felt safe and loved. I love this home. And you know, as I was reading Psalm 84, that's the sense that you get from the psalmist. That as he is looking at his life, he finds within his relationship with what he calls the living God, he finds a safe place. He finds home. Candy shared her journey. And my question for each of us today is, what's the journey of life that we're on? What's our journey? Now, if you're like me and you take notes, I want you to take notes. First of all, our first point is, you'll see in this psalm a pilgrim's heart. A pilgrim's heart. Look in verses 1 and 2. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, what I notice here is that's some strong language. Look at the verbs that he's using. He talks about yearning. He talks about his heart and his flesh crying out. And to whom is he crying out? He's crying out for God. He's crying out for God. So who is this psalmist? Well, the short answer is we really don't know. If you look at commentaries, there's a lot of debate. Some people would say it was David. Others would say, and Travis, who's in the chapel this morning, Travis believes this was actually written while the Jewish people were in exile. And the psalmist is looking back, and he's remembering past pilgrimages and lamenting the fact that those days are over. Many people believe, and I think I fall in this camp, is, no, it's before the exile, and it's a man who loves God. He's an observant Jew, and his heart is called to Jerusalem, to temple, for the worship of God at the holy days at the annual feast, but for whatever reason this year, he's, he's not able to go. Maybe it's health, maybe it's family, but he's not able to go. And so as he's writing this, he's lamenting the fact that he's not in the center of it, that he's not in the action. And as a result, he gives us kind of a travel log of what you would experience on a pilgrimage. Now, you heard Candy talking about her heart and how her heart was transformed. And it wasn't the success or the accolades or the achievement. It was just the love of a loving God. And remember, the psalmist said, he cries out for the living God. That's a pilgrim's heart. You know, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart as well. There's no question about the heart or the treasure of the psalmist. There's no question about that. And in fact, in verse 5, he says, Blessed are those whose heart is set upon pilgrimage. A pilgrimage to who? A pilgrimage to what? A pilgrimage to the living God. That's his heart. Now, I want you to contrast this with another Old Testament reading. It's from the book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Amos issues a warning to the nation. He says this, Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market the wheat? Now, what he's saying there, if I could just paraphrase this, when is this going to be over? When is the Sabbath? When is, in our case, Sunday? When is it over? There's life to live. There's things to do. There's business to conduct. And so you have the heart of the psalmist, and then you contrast it with this. Charles Spurgeon says this, he says, Neither prayer nor praise nor hearing the word of God will be pleasant or profitable to the man who has left his heart behind. The question for us this morning is, where's our heart? When you came in this morning, did you check your heart, did you check your mind at the door? Now, I'm going to share a story about myself that's fairly embarrassing. Really thought about this one. Two weeks ago, we had a combined service in the sanctuary. It was July 2nd, and we had advertised stirring music, and there was stirring music, and we had worship, and Jeff did a marvelous job with Psalm 51. But you might say it was a little long, just a little long. So I'm walking out of church, I'm looking forward to lunch, and I get a text. And I I pull my phone out and I look, it's from one of my favorite deacons, and he says, Hey, great worship service today, exclamation point. It was a little long, and it looked like you agree with me by the way you kept checking 
the clock. I was busted. You know, not only is he a deacon, he's on the personnel committee. I was busted. But you know what? That's not what bothered me. What bothered me is for about two weeks, I'd been meditating on this psalm. It wasn't the fact that somebody caught me. It was the fact that I had checked my heart out. If you asked my wife, she'd say he was thinking of lunch, and I probably was. I'd checked out. And as I thought about it, as I was preparing for this message, I thought, you know what? That's cultural Christianity. I'm a cultural Christian. You know, we talk a lot about that here, and I have a lot of people say, what, what is a cultural Christian? And if you come to the Discover class, we take some time and we talk about that. But a cultural Christian is someone whose preferences trump whatever else. In that case, my watching of the clock. It might mean that I'm a consumer of services and that if the church is meeting my needs, I may be in, I may be out. It may mean that I, I make it more about me and the sacred just becomes kind of familiar and I'll check in when I want to and if the calendar allows and if there's nothing else coming on, guess what, I may be there. You know what's so funny? I've served other churches in other cities. This is the only church where we ever checked the cowboy schedule, or in my case, the falcon schedule, which for most years you wouldn't want to check the falcon schedule. We checked the Baylor Bear schedule. Why? Because that's important to our people. And what we understand here from the psalmist is, where's your heart set? Where's your heart set? And I can tell you, when I think about cultural Christianity, I am a cultural Christian, and I have a sense that most people who grew up in the Bible Belt have a tendency to run that way. Not the psalmist. Not the psalmist. But here's the other thing that I notice about him. He is looking to a place. He's an observant Jew. And as an observant Jew in the Old Testament, they would look to Jerusalem. They would look to the temple. They would look forward to these pilgrimages. They wanted to be there in the action. They wanted to be there where they, where they saw the sacrifices and they knew what was happening in the temple. He even talks about a jealousy for the birds that he sees as he's in the temple courts and they're just flying around. He's thinking, they're here all the time. They can even build their nests. But for us on this side of the cross, we're not on a journey to a place. We're on a journey to a person. We're on a journey to Christ. You heard that in Candy. Again, all that she was given, when did she find rest? She found rest when she found Christ. So let's think about this, about this, a journey to a place. You know, we love this place. Okay, I love this room. I, I served with the building committee for about five years on this room. I love this room. I love this this campus. I will never forget the first day that I walked up to the sanctuary and my eyes did exactly what the architect intended. I went up the steeple to the cross to the heavens. I love this place. But let me ask you this. What happens if we lose this place? The unthinkable. Number one, we're well insured. But number two, number two, we're still a church. We may love it. This may be the center of much of our lives, but I want you to look around the room right now. Literally, look around the room. The people that you're worshiping with, the people in the seats around you, that's the church. That's the church. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. And when we come together collectively, we are the body of Christ. Our journey is to Christ. And collectively, we are Christ. You know, I'm in this building six or seven days a week. I was here most of the day yesterday, and there wasn't anybody here. And I love it then, but I love it on Sundays. I love walking in the halls and kids running by me. I love walking into classrooms and hearing laughter. I love walking into a worship service and everybody raising their voices. I love that. Why? That's the church. And when we are the church, we feel at home. And our journey is to Christ our journey is to Christ. That's our heart. Number two, a pilgrim's journey. Where's the pilgrim going? Look with me in verses 5 through 8. Verses 5 through 8. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools, and they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. 
Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. You know, when I recognize that I'm on a pilgrimage, that I'm on a pilgrimage to Christ, everything is different. Everything's different. My heart's affections are different. My disciplines will be different. Everything's different about me. And the way I look at my life is going to be different. You know, when we moved to Dallas, and it's been a long time ago, but somebody told me the pace of life there's tough. They said, now go to Fort Worth. It's easy over there. But Dallas, is, it's a tough pace. And, you know, they're right. We run at a fast pace here. And what I've discovered is because of the pace of life that we all are under, what happens is we miss some life. And what happens, we tend to go from season to season, from event to event, vacation to vacation, and we miss the significance of the day, of the season. Not so with the pilgrim here. You see, he talks about going through the Valley of Baca. Now, there's some debate as to where the Valley of Baca might be, but not as to what the Valley of Baca was. It would have been a dry, dusty, arid place. It would have been a place that would be discouraging. Some commentaries say it would have been to the west of Jerusalem, and as you walked through, you would have gone through this. That was an arid area, and maybe that's the place. It's not really the place. It's what it represents. It represents a place where it's just no rest for you. Do you ever have those nights when you just don't sleep? Do you ever have those discouraging times when things aren't going well do you ever have those times that you feel like, as Jeff said a few weeks ago, that you're just in the valley of the shadow? That would be Baca to the pilgrim. Now, how do we react? How do we react in the valley of Baca? Well, first of all, the pilgrim is looking to the destination. The destination wasn't this valley. The destination was Jerusalem. The destination was temple. The destination was the presence of the living God because that's what the temple represented to him. He's looking beyond the valley to the destination. And look in verse 6, A. Hey, not only does he talk about the valley, but then he says in the second part of it, they make it a place of springs. They make it a place of springs. He says the autumn rains also cover it with pools. Now, what does he mean by that? I think even in the midst of discouragement, he's saying he's anticipating the blessing of God. Now, he may literally mean that they physically dug wells. They dug holes looking for springs, looking for refreshment, and that may very well be the case. But he's also looking forward to the autumn rains. There will be a day when that area is covered with pools of water that bring life and refreshment. And what he's saying is, by faith, I'm looking beyond where I am now. And what we take from this is our faith, our journey is active. It's not passive. G. Campbell Morgan writes this, Faith has an activity. It passes through the dry places, and faith digs wells of living water. What did Jesus say about living water? He's the water. Faith is active. You know, there are times in our lives, even the little things will throw us. You heard Candy talk about she would get a new car and it was new till she drove it off the lot. We look for, forward to the new home and then it's not exactly what we thought it would be. We're looking forward to the new job and yet the boss is just as big a jerk as the old boss was. And we get discouraged. We look at the circumstances and we don't look beyond the circumstances and what God is calling us to be and do. You know, my life's work at Park Cities, I have the opportunity to walk with people through the very highest of highs. I did a wedding this past weekend in our sanctuary. And there's something about standing there at the altar with the groom and the music is beginning and it's beginning to swell and swell. How many of you guys can relate to this? And you're just kind of leaning forward and you're waiting for that door to open and all of a sudden the door opens and there's your bride and in the sanctuary, if it's during the daylight hours, the light coming in from the street just seems to envelop her and she glows and every time I look it over at the groom and his eyes will well up with tears and then my eyes will well up with tears and I have to say, Shell, you got a man up, you've got to do a service here. And so that's what happened to me this past Friday night. But that's highs. But just two days prior, I'd been with a gentleman in our church in his home, and he was in a great valley of discouragement. Lots of pain. He had been bedridden for weeks and weeks and weeks, and he was discouraged. 
And the question is, in the valley, do we allow that to rob us of all the joy? Do we allow it to rob us of the blessing? All that God might do in our hearts and lives during that season? Or do we just want to get through it and get over? If we do, we miss something. I'll give you a good example. Last year, my family gave me a gift. And that gift was I wanted to get everybody together for a family vacation. And so my daughters, my son-in-law, my wife, they said, we're in. And so we went to Whistler, Canada for about four or five days. And we all like to hike, and so we planned some hikes. And my younger daughter, Molly, said, I'll, I'll do the research. And she's good at that. So on the first night that we were there, she said, okay, here's a listing of hikes. And she said, I've looked for moderate-level hikes. And we said, that's good. We, we can do that. And so we, um, we started looking, and we chose to. The first one was, it was a great hike, and it wasn't hard at all. And we kind of followed the terrain, and it was a little elevation, but not bad. In the end, was a beautiful glacial lake. And all the way around it, there were mountains, and they were capped with snow. It was beautiful. And we got back that night, and we said, this was good, but tomorrow, that's the hike. Because that was going to be a hike to a glacier. I don't know about you, but I've heard glaciers are melting. I want to see a glacier. And so we said, we're in. We want to do the glacier hike. So the next day we got up early. We made our lunches. We went to the trailhead. We got out of the car, and we looked up, and we looked up, and we looked up, and we looked up. And there, if you squinted, there appeared to be a glacier. Took a breath, and we began. And the trail actually started going down. Thought, that's good. I didn't realize you had to make up that elevation. So we start up a little bit. We come to the most beautiful glacial blue lake. It is beautiful. We kind of rimmed it. It was easy. That was good. It kind of energized us a little bit. And then we took a turn, and then the incline began to increase. I think it was about an 89, 90-degree increase. I mean, <laughs> my kids are going to say, he's exaggerating. You ask my wife. She'll say, no, he's not even telling half the story. So we begin this journey, I mean, straight up it seemed. And there's times that our climbing partners leave their mom and I. I am convinced they were trying to find an active cell so they could call the insurance guy and say, get the check cut, we'll tell you where to send it. So we're making our way, we're crawling over boulders, there's this rock field, it's not marked real well. Again, our travel companions are long gone, and we're just hoping that we're going the right direction. There is nobody around us. And so we finally arrive at the top, and there is the most beautiful glacial lake. And there rising out of one end is a mountain, and there's the glacier. We had made it. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we're celebrating my wife's birthday, and we're all together, and it was the very same time we had been in Canada, and we began to talk about it, and we began to talk about the glacier, and Molly finally comes clean. It wasn't a moderate-level hike. She just wanted to see a glacier. <laughs> Everybody laughed, but, but my wife. I mean, uh, <laughs> and we asked the question, would we do it again? And the answer was from everybody, yeah, we would, we would do it again. Well, I've thought about that in the last few days, and I thought, but what if? What if knowing how hard that hike was, we had arrived at that trailhead, and all of a sudden we noticed they had just opened up a beautiful new cable car. And that cable car would take you up to the top of the mountain, and we would go over the lakes that we had seen. We would go by the waterfalls that we had walked by and kind of cooled us. We could wave at those rocks and those boulder fields, and it would deposit us right at the edge of the glacier. Would we have done it? Well, two of us would have done that. I can promise you that. I don't know about the other three, but two of us would have been in it. I don't care what it would have cost. And what I decided was, and I'd have missed it. You know, I don't know about you. I've seen a lot of beautiful sights in my life, and I've forgotten most of them. Trust me, I'm never forgetting the glacier. The struggle was worth the beauty. I'd have forgotten it. And if I try to rush through the valley, I may miss what God is doing. And again, my attitude can be such that God can't do anything with me, and I can be angry, and I can be upset, or I can seek Him, and I can trust Him. That's the journey of a pilgrim. And what he says here in verse 7 is, we go from strength to strength. As we are walking, as we're walking through this valley, and some of you today are in the valley. I've been praying for this service especially hard since we talked with Candy. Some of you are in the position that Candy was in. We go from strength to strength. Paul writes in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, 
But we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Perseverance, character, hope are developed in the valley. One of my favorite authors recently has been a guy by the name of Mark Batterson. I, I like reading him, and he's written a book called All In. And I found this, and it just fits really well. Listen, we all want to spend eternity with God. We just don't want to spend time with Him. We stand and stare from a distance, satisfied with superficiality. We Facebook more than we seek His face. We text more than we study the text. And our eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on our iPhones and our iPads. And the emphasis is on I. And then we wonder why God feels so distant. We wonder why we're bored with our faith. It's because we're holding out. We want joy without sacrifice. We want character without suffering. We want success without failure. We want gain without pain. We want a testimony without the test. We want it all without going all out for it. In the words of A.W. Tozier, eternity will not be long enough to learn all he is or to praise him for all he's done. But you don't get to know God by looking at Him at a distance. You have to hike into the depths of His power and the heights of His holiness. There's a journey we're called to. And as we follow the journey, He gives us strength to strength. As we close, number three, a pilgrim's strength. I want you to listen to these statements of a pilgrim. We might say these are the statements of someone who is following Jesus and following Jesus every day. In verse 5, He says, They've set their heart on pilgrimage. Now, what that means is there is a decision. There's a decision to enter that pilgrimage. Candy talked about a decision. But it's not just a once and only decision. It is a daily decision. If I want to follow Jesus, if I want to have the heart of a pilgrim, there's a daily decision, and each and every day I make the decision to follow Him to follow Him daily. In verse 6, He tells us there's going to be seasons of difficulty. Again, it's not if there's going to be difficulty in your life. It's going to be when there is. Just those dry, arid times when things don't seem to go well. But what does God say? He says at the last part of that verse, He's going to make a way. Active faith. He calls upon us to dig those wells. But He also says there's going to be the autumn rains. They're going to come. They're going to come. He says in verse 7 that we're going to make it. He says in verse 7 that we go from strength to strength. We go from strength to strength. Look in verse 10. He says this, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We sang that a few moments ago. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O oh Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Not only are we going to make it, he tells us right here, there is blessing. There's blessing on the journey. There's blessing in his presence when our heart is seeking him. Again, I've referred to it several times, but Candy's testimony just so moved me as she talked about all that God had done in her life, all that she had done. She was the story of success in North Dallas. And yet it wasn't until she came to that position where she made a decision, where she entered into a pilgrimage, that God was able to take that which had been empty and fill it. And all the good things in her life were still there, but now they had new meaning. He'll reward our faithfulness. Verse 11 and 12, He rewards our faithfulness. You know, the Apostle Paul writes about this. In Romans chapter 8, and you don't need to turn there, I want you to listen. I want you to check your heart in right now and check your mind in. And he talks about just the unimaginable scope of what it means to follow Jesus. Listen to this, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who it is it that condemns Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now listen, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Doesn't that sound like the valley of Baca? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so my question for us as we close, where are you on the pilgrimage? You know, I really believe with all my heart there's somebody here that needed to hear Candy's testimony. Where are you? Do you need to take that first step of of faith, what it means to ask the questions. If you're here and you'd like to talk with someone, right out these doors following this service, we'll have staff and we'll have a team there. We'd love to talk with you about what that means. You may be here today and you may say, no, I've made that faith decision, but I'm not engaged in a church family. You need to be in the body of Christ. You need to be engaged as we talked about a few moments ago. But for most of us, for most of us, it's just asking some questions. Do you really trust Him? Do you trust Him with the little things in life? I know we sometimes trust Him with the big, but we got everything else. Do you trust Him with everything in your life? Do you trust Him with your dating life? Do you trust Him with your marriage? Do you trust Him with your children or your infertility? Do you trust Him with your boss or your career? Do you trust Him with the diagnosis you just received in your health? Do you trust Him with your family, your parents, or your grandchildren? you trust God? I want you to open your Bibles again and look back to verse 11 and 12. And if you're like me and you write in your Bibles, take your pen or your pencil and circle verses 11 and 12. They're a promise. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows, fa bestows favor and honor and no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman who trusts in you. And my friends, this is the promise of God. May we pray together. Father, as we uh, consider all that you've called us to do, all that you've called us to be, Lord, I pray for those here today who, who need to understand what it means to be on a faith pilgrimage. I pray, Father, that they would come to the end of themselves and understand that there is hope and there's significance and there's life. And Father, I know there are those of us in here who, who might say, yeah, Shell, I'm a cultural Christian as well. It really has been all about me. It's about what I want to do in my calendar. And I'm not trusting Him the way I should. I, I, this is an opportunity. Seek the Lord. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.